Welcome to the internet, live from the Marriott Library at the University of Utah. This is the Red Line Podcast. I'm your host, quote, an indeterminate amount of raccoons in a trench coat, unquote, <laughs> Dunstan, and these are my co-hosts. Schrodinger's trench coat. <laughs> now, the trench coat exists. It's the number of raccoons that's in question. Uh, all caps, Holland, comma, all caps, Kyle, and... Fielder, comma, Alex. Today we're chatting about urban growth boundaries, the controversial spool control that has been adopted by many cities as a strategy of curbing spool. <laughs> Redundancy club. <laughs> they do, do they work, or are there bigger issues with them that make them a bad idea? All this after the news. The, the, the National Redundancy Society Society. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the ATM, ATM machine. machine. <laughs> uh, SMH my head. <laughs> what is your opinion on urban... Like, I know you maybe, like, don't know anything. Maybe. You might know something. What is, like, your your thing? Like, I have the heard the name... First? No. Oh. Urban Growth Boundary. What's your opinion? It's like an iron curtain around your city in which no city housing shall penetrate. The sphere! The sphere! I need to play the, like, uh, red, red, Hunt for Red October theme song here. What do you think about urban growth boundaries? They sound objectively like a good idea of protecting farmland and the green spaces and open lands. It sounds to me like having a valley for all the losers who don't have valleys. Yeah. Except it hasn't worked, Kyle. Having a valley. Yeah, so maybe we need a valley just and doing an it urban into growth will. boundary. Like, er, like, geographic constraints don't work too well when there's, like, another valley. I mean, we're doing it better. It works on an island. We're doing better than, like, Denver. Yeah, Denver. Not really. <laughs> I don't know. We think we're, we like to pretend we're doing better than Denver, but we're not. In the long term, we'll probably be better than Denver. Why? Still bad. It's still a problem, but we're leaking but less than if we were on like empty planes. I, I think you are dead wrong, and I will prove it to you. In this ensuing episode, which you wrote? Yes. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, the news. Do, 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 do. Showing once again how construction costs are breaking the back of transit operators and cities around the United States, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey has announced today that it is canceling a planned air train or subway extension to LaGuardia Airport in Queens. The move comes after cost estimates jumped rapidly and the proposed subway service will be replaced by over $500 million what? in improvements to the Q70 bus route, a staggering number in and of itself. This comes after a massively slashed Project Connect plan was leaked from Cap Metro in Austin earlier this week, outlining the absolute necessity of bringing costs under control as quickly as possible. How are they spending $500, $500 million on bus improvements? Mile bus lane. And some Q slips. Huh. Maybe this should be like $5 million, not $500 million. Well, also, um, to sort of note the second note that I brought up... Um, Cap Metro is slashing the project again it to like got. a single like ten mile line with no subway for like ten billion dollars. <laughs> Jeez, oh. this is not even. This was anymore. this was leaked on Twitter by a Cap Metro staffer uh, earlier this week because of like how disturbing it is that they've gone from like you know this whole big project to like maybe one line and it's still going to cost the same amount. Costs have like gone from bad, and I guess we're not going to get as much built to literally obscene. Yeah, well, and I mean like this the subway extension, which is like I don't know, two three miles to LaGuardia from whichever place they were extending it from, was going to be like between uh, two point five million dollars if they'd done it as a light rail shuttle, or two point five billion dollars if they'd done it as a light rail shuttle. And six point something billion dollars if it was going to be a real subway. Six billion? Six billion dollars. With a B? For With like B. two or three oh miles? It's like two to three billion dollars per mile. Uh-huh. How many staff are operating this tunnel boring machine? Like 300 and they're all, <laughs> and they're all independently, independent consultants? I don't think... Th- I think that they've hired the entire city of New York to dig it out by hand is what their plan was. <laughs> That'd probably be cheaper. Most probably. Like, yeah. Yeah. And, and faster. And two supervisors <laughs> per person. Yes, uh, all brought in from the Jersey suburbs. Yes. Well. And they're all being paid consultant rates. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and anyway, it- New York should be fired, first of all. 
just anyone at Cap Metro who is somehow value engineering this project and making it more expensive at the t- same time <laughs> should be fired. Everyone should be fired, and people who are competent should be put in their place so that we can actually build things and they don't cost a trillion dollars. Yeah, concept. This is concerning. Yeah, very <laughs> concerning. Oh, also, I should note that um, I forgot to put this down as a news item, but. In other news, the MBTA recently instituted a system-wide 10 to 25 mile per hour speed restriction due to a failed check geometry scan earlier in the year that affected every single line. As of this time, all lines, except for part of the red line and the entire green line on all sections, have been back into regular service. But, you know, it's the MBTA, so a month from now, I don't know, South Station will burn to the ground or something, probably. (laughs) Can the MBTA not just have, like, some vaguely competent people who have, like, looked at a train once in their life? (laughs) Two words, Kyle. Charlie Baker. (sighs) What's his deal? He was the governor of Massachusetts, Um. and he and his predecessors gutted the MBTA. And now it has problems. Yes. You see, wow. service. <laughs> <laughs> yes, actually, Charlie Baker was coincidentally a Republican. Oh, very surprising. Very uh, surprising. Very surprising. Got to cut service until it yeah, literally catches fire. Republicans and good <laughs> governance are synonymous. <laughs> I mean, Democrats and good governance aren't synonymous, but um, at least stuff gets mildly well Sometimes well-funded. it is. Sometimes Democrats can govern. At Republicans, least, it seems, can never govern. Apparently, at least money gets sho- large amounts you of money get shoveled in the You should probably cut this part out because right somebody direction. was criticizing me for being too partisan on Twitter. Well, I hate to break it to you, bud, but one party wants cities to be burned to the ground and everyone in them to die, or preferably move to the suburbs and become a rich, r- rich white person. Uh, <laughs> simply become white. Yeah, simply become rich. <laughs> And white, and then um, the other city is like marginally not antagonistic to the city as a whole. Yes, I know my computer is making noise. I don't know what's wrong with it. Well, you can hide it down there. So anyway, there's my rant about Twitter for the day. Okay, this has been the news and an extended rant about Republicans. The Redline Podcast, now with twice as many fan noises. Yes. Uh, the eternal question. No, <laughs> we're not starting with this. But it's a tradition now. So you tradition. could just skip the question and say the thing. No, no I do not. No, no, you need an intro. Yeah. Yeah. You can't just jump in. Yes, yes, you can. Well. It's called giving background, Kyle. <laughs> okay, but the particular question and, oh, that's the answer and it's exactly what you thought it was. What are Wait urban growth boundaries, <laughs> Alex? <laughs> well, urban growth boundaries <laughs> do, as their name suggests, limiting legally <laughs> developing land within a certain border. Areas outside of the urban growth boundary are generally preserved <laughs> as open space, farmland, and forest. What about yeah. illegal developments? <laughs> that's pretty difficult because yeah. you have to get like code inspectors and you have to have water. Do you? Yes. You can buy those like five gallon jugs. Yeah, and you're just going to keep those on top of your house until... You can well, you build one, your house up. You put one in the toilet jugs. and you put one, the other one on top of the dishwasher. Dishwasher uses a lot more than five gallons of water. You no, just like you switch it out the whole time. They're, they're very efficient. No. It's always better than hand washing dishes. I don't know. It, it's How less than hand washing. Does the same amount. You see, the trouble with not hand washing though is that it never gets clean because well, dishwasher. Only because we have a shit dishwasher. Set. On well, average, I guess I've never had a good dishwasher. Four point two <laughs> gallons per cycle. Oh well, total. Do, so you got to replace it every time. Do you run the hot tap before you turn the dishwasher on? No. Do that. That make it better. Doesn't have like a built-in heater, anyways. No, it, it just takes hot water from the hot water. Oh, some of them have built-in heaters that melt your dishes, too. Fancy ones, I guess. <sighs> yeah. I don't think ours has that. Good dishwasher episode. Yeah. Of uh, the technology. Oh, we could have technology connections as a guest. The, in, <laughs> the technology, or wait, the information revolution and its consequences, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Allowing internet collapse? Yeah. Or a disaster yeah. for humanity. He, he's the one that made the video. About dishwashers, yeah, the, the the literature. Yeah. 
Also, so how did you come <laughs> up with the best but Costco doesn't have them? So. Urban growth boundaries are the modern sibling of the green belt, which is kind of an older concept. Uh, so green belt is just like a strip of undevelopable land, but it's possible to build outside them, which means you can effectively just encourage sprawl much further away. Uh, urban growth boundaries work a bit differently because they normally kind of interface with other surrounding areas so that those areas also don't have like you know terrible sprawl so like green belt kind of just like preserving open land urban growth boundary is a lot more about like preserving everything dense development smart yeah. growth etc cetera, etc cetera. not not doing all the farmland yes not undoing all the farmland um and then it's also important to note that urban growth boundaries are not like, you know, some impermeable buffer. It's not, as Kyle said, an iron curtain around your city. <laughs> um, they're normally expanded relatively often. The idea is that instead of like, you know, just having whoever wants to sprawl wherever do that, you get to decide and plan where new, new sprawl is permitted, basically. So you can plan for it, you can get like transportation to it, you can make sure you have water and services already, already. Fair. Yeah. Fair. Yeah. So, for an example of um, like kind of how much these are expanded, because it's not like uncommon, like you'd think like wow, it must be a big deal to get an urban growth boundary expansion. Not really, most of the time it's just kind of small. Uh, so Metro, which is Portland's regional government slash planning body, has expanded their UGB nearly 36 times since it was instituted in the early 70s, uh, and that's by over 60,000 acres in total. That's like once every couple of years? Once every year, basically. Once every year, too, yeah. Just minor changes, though. Well, I mean, most of the time, it's according, 60, to, acres. A me according to Metro's website, most of these expansions have been like, you know... 200 acres here, 300 there, 40 here, 40 there. But there have been a couple just, like, really large ones. Like, um, in the 80s, uh, kind of south of Gresham and east of Oregon City, if you have any idea what or or Portland's geography looks like, there's this whole undeveloped area, and they kind of just expanded it all at once, and it, boom, new area, basically. Interesting. New dense area, though? No, Clatco okay. is not, Clackamas County is not really... Super dense. Okay. Not really into this whole good urban form thing. So, yeah. is that the advantage of expanding slower? Is you probably get more density? Probably because if you 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 know you do the same amount of fighting to expand eighteen thousand acres versus like you know two hundred acres, mm -hmm. same amount of getting approval from the state. So it sort of incentivizes whoever's developing that to not put in that effort you know as much, so they can put more on what they've got. There. So that, yeah. this is Metro, not to be confused with Metro, right? Yes, or Metro, metro yeah. not to be confused with Metro, 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 or Metro, metro, metro Subway or Metro. <laughs> okay. Yes. Glad we got that out of the way. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's only one Metro that's a regional planning body, I think. So. So far. No one else is gonna do that. So far. No, like everybody, everywhere else likes to be more original with their name. Like the Wasatch Front Regional Council. The Wasatch Front Regional Council. I don't think actually. Council. Do they actually have any power to do anything? Not really. No, they're oh, just okay. Metro, suggestive. Metro. Uh, we're gonna have to talk about this someday, but Metro has very unique structure in that it is like the only directly elected regional governance body. Yeah, in there's the this cool and it actually does things. I want this. Yeah. Well. Too bad. The things that it does are not always good, but you know. Yes. Okay, well, ours just doesn't do anything, and then the legislature oh, ours can't worse do things. anything because it's not any power. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'd settle for occasionally good things. That's better than mostly bad things or nothing. Yeah. Uh, I guess we'll have to discuss Metro further in detail. Yeah. Metro. Anyway. Uh, so, according to the Department of Communities and Local Government, which is a British institution, uh, <laughs> there are five main purposes for instituting a green belt or an urban growth boundary. Number one, fairly self-explanatory, uh, to stop the unrestricted sprawl of large built-up areas. Valid. Valid, yeah. Considered, that's considered good because then it just starts eating all your farmland and all your open space. Well, forests, yeah. Yep. Yeah. It just Not eats good. All, all land. It just, yeah, it consumes land very quickly as well. Um... Number two, to prevent neighboring towns from merging into one another. Interesting. So the idea is that instead of having, like, you know, 
like like Sandy and Draper used to be separate communities that had a little <laughs> bit separating them, and now they are one giant homogenous blob that is the South Valley. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So the idea is that you have like you know actual towns. Concept. That would be nice. Yes. Wouldn't it? And then I guess all of them get access to this non gobbled up green space. Yes. Uh, number three, to assist in safeguarding the countryside from encroachment, which is basically the same as number three, or number one, but a little different. Like, you don't want, you know, all of your farms to just be... <laughs> yeah, farms good, actually. Unless they're alfalfa farms in a state that's under drought. In that case, farm land is still good. We should just use something else on it. Like yep. food. <laughs> Food that isn't fed to food other that food. humans are capable of digesting. I mean, we're capable of digesting alfalfa. It's just not going to end very well for you. I don't. I don't. I don't think we. No, I think that's one of those can, like grassy yeah. high fiber things. Yeah. isn't it? That's like eating grass. I, I mean, put it in your stomach, acid yeah, so will devol- dissolve eventually. I'm sure. <laughs> will you get any nutrients out of it? Is the question. <laughs> well, I mean, who cares about nutrients? They're just trying to <laughs> dissolve it. <laughs> um. Interesting. <laughs> Uh, Number four. This podcast was written by a cow. (laughs) (laughs) Number four. That's rude. Um, Number four, to preserve the setting and character of historic towns. So, you know, you have um, Clappingham upon upon Thames, right? And, And it's this charming little town. Most of it was built in, like, you know, 1820 or whatever. Uh, and then, you know, Jim Bob McGee and Associates comes in and builds, you know, 4,000 acres of suburban tract housing where people are going to drive two hours into central London for work, right? Uh, All that housing fails to really be, like, a part of the, the town. Yeah, it just turns the town into kind of like a nightmare instead just of an actual town. A new exurb. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so where basically, like against the exurbanization of, like, small outlying towns. Whereas with, like, a slowly growing urban growth boundary, you can get development that actually contributes to your town. Maybe. I'm making an Illuminati symbol. Oh. If, if the audience wants to hear. You could also build a pyramid. Well, I mean, <laughs> it worked for Memphis. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. know, Bass Pro Shops pyramid. Uh, and then number five, to assist in urban regeneration by encouraging the reuse and redevelopment of disused or disinvested land in cities. So maybe instead of the bee is going to daybreak, they'd stay here and we'd revamp ballpark. Maybe instead of building the point trademark, we'd revamp um, the granary. Well, I mean, the point would be well within the UGB at this point, so... Um, other possible benefits are keeping supplies of fresh food close to urban cores. Very oh, good. Yes. Um, allowing for easy recreation in open space by urban residents. You don't have to drive, you know, 500 miles from New York City to find, like, a tree. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, encouraging smart, efficient development within cities. Creating a stronger sense of regional and city identity. Um and allowing for a more detailed long-term transportation plan, especially in public transportation, because if your city is constantly just, like, exploding to the depths of the universe, right, like a big bang of horrific car infrastructure, then it's kind of hard to plan because every year, you know, the, the further, like, the furthermost outest, the furthest out ring of suburban development gets, you know, a mile further and then a mile further. And so you have to, you know, figure out how to serve these areas. And if you're, you know, planning when and where you're going to be expanding. And then you can also build transit when you build transportation networks when you build new developments. Or before. Before is preferable, yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Questions, comments, concerns. Nope, that's the episode. And thank you to (laughs) our page. That's the episode. (laughs) Well, the episode continues for a while. Urban growth boundaries, or at least building dense and up, seems like it would always be better for wildlife as well. Well, in yeah, because land. wildlife. Oh my god! I like driving, and I like you. You like te- you tour. like ruining your car by hitting a deer, yeah. and then having to buy a new. Yeah. 2024 Ford Explorer. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, if you hit a cow, you have to no, buy a I new get cow an, too. No, I get an Escalade. 
Oh. Okay. Gotta, you know, increase the luxury of my vehicle. Yeah, the vehicle you don't, well, you will increasingly spend more time in. Yeah, because yeah. I'm, you know, moving further away. Mm hmm. If come away from home. Yeah. If insurance, uh, does insurance cover it if you hit a cow? Do they cover buying a new cow? Um, <laughs> probably if you have comprehensive. Oh, that's true. Does anybody actually have that? Yes. All, all three people? People with new cars generally get comprehensive insurance. Ah, Ooh, fancy. cars. That sounds expensive. If you have a used car, you're just going to get liability because it's a used car. Sound effects by You did Kyle. this for what? Oh, <laughs> uh, yes. Podcast ASMR. That's actually going to sound really bad. I know. <sighs> well, anyway, what's the history of urban growth factories? <laughs> <laughs> Every episode. Uh, Can we at least say it in French or something? Uh, quelle est l'histoire de le, uh, le frontier de... Divinution urbaine. Quelle est l'histoire de divinution urbaine? There you go. Cool. Now read the rest French. of the script in French. Uh, UGB et uh, <laughs> uh, Piment Vert, son uh, frère plus ancien, sont les plus communes aux uh, pays anglophones. Il existe en les États-Unis, Canada. Le Royaume-Uni et Australie. Aussi en Nouvelle-Zélande et Sud-Afrique. You're getting a lot better. I'm getting French. a little better. Yeah. That's crazy. Very, very fast. Good yeah. job. That was not very fast. That was very slow. Okay, so to skip the French, uh, yeah, Urban Growth. Why are we skipping the French? Pourquoi sont. Um, so, urban growth boundaries and green belts, which are, as we discussed earlier, their older brother, are most common in the Anglophone world, existing in the United States, Canada, United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa. Why not other places? It seems to be kind of an Anglo thing, to be honest with you. It's other cool. places have more of, have different ways of controlling urban growth. Interesting. What does, like, Switzerland do? I have no clue. Cool. You, you mean people who aren't in the Anglophone world want to live in cities? Yes. <gasps> I know. Come back for episode two where Anglo we brain. just talk about Switzerland. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anglo brain sometimes. Um, uh, urban growth boundaries actually got their start in the United Kingdom near the beginning of the 20th century. After two centuries of massive urban growth, especially in Greater London, there was increasing concern about the rate at which farmland was being consumed because England is not a large country. And London is a very large city. <laughs> yeah, what did we what did we say about um, islands being the one with the natural uh, growth boundary and the you know finite well, amount of resources? <laughs> I mean, I'm talking like a one island, like a city can take up an entire island, would be an effective example of geography constraining growth. Vatican yeah. City. Yeah. Well, yeah. I guess here geography says you've got a finite amount of resources and land to use. Which better figure it the hell out soon. Everywhere, to be fair, so. If tell, you that can, the, tell that to the state government. If you could climb up a tower and see the border of your island, you'd probably be smart about it. Yeah. Right? yeah. Uh, so the Council for the Preservation of Rural England, which is now, I believe, called the Countryside Charity and is kind of like whatever the equivalent of the thing we have that supports national parks and, like, open lands. The Park Service. No. Like oh. like a like a non profit organization, like an advocacy. The Sierra group. Club? Yeah, the Sierra Club. Cool. Thank you. Uh, it's like it's like an English Sierra Club basically. And they were like, Hey, we have all this, you know, picturesque English countryside here <laughs> with, you know, uh, cobblestone walls. What if we and built green houses fields. on it? What if we blew everything up? didn't sprawl into it? And so they came they came into existence in nineteen twenty six. Um, and then the first actual proposal to create a green belt was submitted to the Greater London Regional Planning Committee in 1935, uh, but English municipalities would not gain the power to actually regulate land uses by themselves until the 1947 Town and Country Planning Act. That's a good time to do that. Yes, right after everything just got the shit bombed out of it. Yep. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And post-war boom. Yes. Yep. Um... Is some, oh this was what I wanted to say, uh, in the United Kingdom 
they put the date of the bill's year before the bill. In the United States, we put it after the bill. So you have the Civil Rights Act of 19-whatever, and they would have the 19-whatever Civil Rights Act, which I think is interesting. Yeah, it's like in Spanish, everything is like of this or of that. And here we use the possessive form. Hmm. True. <laughs> Seems easy to organize. Um, Instead of saying the service act of year, of year we would well, say the year service act. Yeah, but then you're grouping everything by year instead of what it does. Because we name a lot of bills the same thing, just pass them in different years. I take it. So you would have so you'd have the Civil Rights Act of 1960, 1965, 1972, 1983, 1940. You know, so you have a bunch of Civil Rights Act. You just tell what one does by year. So I, I think that's a more effective way to do it. But I'm not British, so I can't tell them what to do. Well, they're doing the same thing, just emphasizing the year. Yeah. More history, so. Yeah, but how'd that turn out for him? Uh, <laughs> they lost. Got me there. <laughs> yeah. Everything that has ever done is bad because of the current state of the country. Next. Yes, true. Um <laughs> So, the first London green belts began to be established in 1955 and have generally stayed in place since. Um, and then, in the United States, the first urban growth boundary was put into place in Lexington, Lexington Kentucky in 1958. Local leaders were concerned about local horse farms, which were closely tied to regional identity and the economy, so they decided to limit growth in the city. What? Kentucky is a big horse racing state. You know, the Kentucky Derby, that's not in Lexington, but like... Yeah. Yeah, no, Horse it's, racing a, it's is actually in Dayton, Ohio. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's, in, it's in Louisville, thank you. I actually know where it is this time. Because you checked. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to make sure I wasn't like, hmm, yeah, the uh, Kentucky Derby, that's in Lexington, Kentucky. Mm-hmm. Then have horse racing people come after us. <laughs> yeah. Cancelled by horse racing Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> I I would not be mad about that. I think that'd be funny. Yeah, Twitter would. Yeah. Next um, year, cancelled by horse racing Mastodon. Oh no. <laughs> uh, the first statewide <laughs> urban growth boundary policy was put into place in 1970 by Oregon Governor Tom McCall. Oregon, like Lexington, was concerned about ongoing sprawl and farm forest land consumption for urban growth, so the state required cities to establish urban growth boundaries and seek regulatory approval for their expansion from the state. Interesting. So you're regulating land use on a statewide basis instead of just as a city. I mean, that's that's a lot similar to, like, Portland's regional council, except without a regional council. Sounds a lot more effective. Yes. This is definitely one of those policies that shouldn't be at the municipal level. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, Tom McCall, um, actually probably one of the better governors of the 20th century that nobody talks about. Cool. Like, he was a Republican, which, you know, I know, scary, bad, etc. Um, a lot of the, like, kind of, for a while, it's, it's kind of, you know, regressed now. But for a while, Oregon was kind of the leader in environmental policy, environmental like, regulation probably of the world and Tom McCall has a lot to do with that. He was just a real cool guy. Cool. Also nice. famously exploded a whale. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Um, this act created what is perhaps the most famous urban growth boundary of all, the Portland urban growth boundary, which is the one everyone likes to talk about. Cool. So, does... Kentucky still have an open growth boundary? Uh, yeah, so um, in the United States, Washington, Oregon, and Kentucky require cities to establish urban growth boundaries, and um, a lot of cities in other places have like the, just their own. Like Van Does Vancouver, Washington have one because it's basically Portland? Yes. Cool. It's just not the same one as Portland has. And they can because expand it different because they're a different state. Yeah. That sounds potentially problematic. But that's but. that's something I think is really interesting about, like, you know, Republicans don't like urban growth boundaries. And why exactly? We may never know. No, I think why exactly we know. <laughs> like, it's a restriction of personal property. You can't, you know, build whatever you like but, wherever but you like. But R1 zoning. Well... You know, 
It's a different restriction of personal property. Okay, but it is still a restriction of personal property, and conservatives don't like that when it's something they don't like. Okay, so <laughs> UGB bad, single-family exclusive zoning good. Yes. What? Nothing about ideology has to be politically consistent, Kyle. <laughs> okay, so I, I'm not sure I buy this explanation of it's a restriction of freedom. Well, I didn't say it was a restriction of freedom. I said it's a restriction of personal property rights, which it is. Ah. And not the kind of restriction. It's the restriction that restricts your property rights, not other people's. Yeah. Yeah. As opposed to R1 zoning, which does what you want and restricts other people. Yeah, the entire Republican ethos. <laughs> <laughs> Why is this so Freedom hard? for me, but not for ye. So, um, yeah, so Republican they don't like urban growth boundaries. Um, so kind of one of the arguments that's made for sort of the inefficacy of the Portland urban growth boundary is, well, you're just exporting sprawl elsewhere. You're exporting it, you know, across the river to Vancouver and... Uh, well, good thing Vancouver and to has McMinnville a too. and uh, uh, Harvard and all these other you know little towns on the fringe, when in reality all of these places actually have their own urban growth boundaries that they have to seek regulatory approval to move. And this is why we do it on the statewide level. So why don't Republicans like preserving farmland and farmers? Yeah, isn't that like the well whole they thing? do, but only so far as it. Doesn't like eat, I said, nothing not has to be consistent. As long as it doesn't eat into the profits of the oil lobby? Well, essentially, yes. Okay. Like, yeah, the, that's, know, that's consistent. The, the farm lobby is a big lobby, but it's not as big as the oil lobby. Mm. So the farm lobby gets different, you know, level of prioritization than the oil lobby does. <laughs> mm. If you think of all these policies from the perspective of the oil lobby, they make more sense. Well, yes, but like, you know... There are legitimate ideological reasons why a libertarian would oppose urban growth boundaries. I mean, if they also oppose um, restrictive well, zoning, then good for mostly them. Mostly they do. Cool. Good for them. Because it's, you know, it's a restriction of personal property rights. All right, cool. Good for them. Yep. Only, re- only, you know, and bleep this out, please. Um So, yeah, as we discussed in the United States, Washington, Oregon, and Kentucky require cities to establish urban growth boundaries, and there are, you know, a few dozen other cities nationwide that have adopted less flashy urban growth boundaries because it's kind of a spectrum, right? Like, you can get very restrictive in your urban growth boundary. Like, I would say Portland is a very restrictive urban growth boundary. They only expanded it by, like, 60,000 acres. Yeah, that's not very much. So, like, they've expanded, you know, population in Portland since the urban growth boundary was initiated by, like, 40, 50 percent in the metro area. They've expanded the land area by, like, 14 percent, which is significant. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, so, like I said, there's a spectrum. And then there's some people who are just, you know more loath to approve kind of exurban style development, I guess, on Mm -hmm. the fringe. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, In the United Kingdom, there are 14 green belts surrounding most of England's major population centers, and they make up a combined 12% of all English land. Which is... Sweet. That's a lot. Yeah, that is a lot. Like, I think England's like 40,000 square miles, so like that's four... It's like 4,800 square a miles that are protected by these. Could not be us. Gosh. <laughs> <laughs> um, New Zealand's largest city, Auckland, has a metropolitan urban limit. I was unable to discover what that means, but I assume it's probably some somewhere. form of urban growth boundary. Probably. Uh, Melbourne, Victoria, uh, in Australia, has a state-imposed urban growth boundary. Uh, they didn't want it, but the state made them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, But it's been expanded a lot, so it's pretty flexible. Uh, South Africa, as a whole country, seems to require urban growth boundaries for large municipalities. Uh, They call it an urban fence there, though, which is interesting. We should build a real fence around Portland. Why is that? Keep all the liberals in. (laughs) Why can't we call... Urban wall sounds better than urban fence. Build a wall. Build a brick wall. And yeah, like build, expand. like, an old-style, like, you know, yeah. medieval wall around the whole city. And then when you expand it, have some people disassemble the wall and put it somewhere else. 
Jobs. Right. That would be good for jobs. Jobs. That is a jobs, good jobs yeah. program, actually. Yeah, you like, you like jobs. <laughs> I do like jobs. Um, so, and then several former Eastern Bloc countries, such as Romania and Albania, have some form of urban growth boundary mandate at the national level. Cool. cool. And good. then China, it seems, is trying to make one. They can make one if they want. It's mm. China. They well, yeah. Yeah. So I, I don't know how that's going to go for them. They can make a boundary, and inside of it, you have to build buildings that stay standing, and outside of it, it's okay if they fall over. <laughs> I think it's okay if all buildings fall over in China, given the amount of buildings that fall over on an average weekday <laughs> in China. Yeah. Well, if we separate them on other sides of a, of a medieval wall, then this oh, might I be see. better. Mm-hmm. So you'll have the city, and then you'll have the rubble. So the Great Womb of China was the first urban growth boundary. <laughs> yes. Sure, that it, definitely. It was That's saving the, the untouched Mongolian steppe from the ravages <laughs> of Han and uh, Shang expan- Han and Shang Dynasty expansionism. Yep. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, Let's just put it that way. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, as we've discussed briefly before, there are uh, some controversies surrounding urban growth boundaries. <gasps> didn't yeah? Didn't see this one coming. Yeah, they are very disliked in many circles for different reasons. Yep. Mm. So on the right, as we discussed, urban growth boundaries are a serious restriction on the rights of property owners. Okay. Not wrong. Yeah. Nope. Uh, It's true. And then, (laughs) you know, some people are ideologically opposed to restrictions on the rights of property owners. I'm not. I don't know if you guys are, but... I don't... I don't think it's an issue if it's just some places... And you, you can move somewhere else. I mean, and I'm different amount. You can of move to Utah. <laughs> well, I, you know, I'm generally of the idea that if a, pro- a property owner owns something, they should be able to do most of what they want on it. That's the key word, most. Like urban growth boundaries. You own a farm and do basically any vaguely farming the related thing you want. You can build a different shape of farmhouse. Go for it. Yeah, and you, then can, if, you can grow, like, you know, peas instead of corn on it or whatever. And then if you own a plot of oh. land in insert suburb at, in, close to the UGB, you can build anything between one and four stories as long as it's 30% bricks. Yeah, I don't believe in height restrictions. I am ideologically opposed to height restrictions. Well, I also don't believe in those, but that's, that's <laughs> yeah. a good example of you, you're allowed to do most things, just not literally everything. I think it's better to have shared land like shared outdoor space, green space, than yeah. to have everyone have a one acre plot with a massive yeah, house on it. Yeah, that is infinitely better yeah. from an environmental and user experience. This is true. Definitely. Like, Everybody should just have a cute little British back garden. Yes. That's like 500 <laughs> square feet and um, is packed to the brim with plants and dogs. And so then, then you pave over it because you're in England and want to park a car. You want to put a car. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And then you soon realize that was a stupid idea because you liked your back garden and your car just cost too much money. That burns petrol, which you're now costs 500 like pounds a British, a yeah, You're talking like a British... It's like a Boston accent yeah, more than a British accent. But then you live in England, so you're just sad and... <laughs> <laughs> so. uh, um, other folks are just, like, anti-urban in general, and <laughs> which, you know... That's a viewpoint. That is a viewpoint. Um... So they like suburban development, and they're like, excuse me, why would we be forcing compact development when suburban development is clearly superior? They're not forcing it. If you want to build a million-dollar, 5,000-square-foot house on a one-acre plot of land, you're absolutely allowed to do that inside the UGB. That's not against any rules. In some places. In some places. In the spirit of you should be able to do most things. I think that should be allowed as long as you pay for the land and pay for the building. Again, I don't think... If you have that much of an issue with it, maybe just find somewhere live else in the country, to live. Like, yeah. Live in Wyoming. Yeah. They don't care. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And then there are also some kind of arguments. And I say on the left here, I don't mean like leftists. I just mean... Blue, red... Bleep that. Liberals. <laughs> um, <laughs> We have um, a bell curve, and part of it is blue, and part of it is red. We have, yeah, we have the Overton window. I'm talking about the left half of the Overton window, not Marxist-Leninists. Um, <laughs> so, there are some serious arguments. Uh, and I've seen it convincing you argued that this could be an issue, uh, that urban growth boundaries have an impact on housing affordability in urban areas. 
Uh, the idea is that restricting the supply of developable land will make housing more expensive. It is true. It does. Yep. Especially of the, you know, single-family variety. Well, the main um, thing it does and is then, increase the price of land. Well, yes, which increases the price of housing. Some types of housing and overall well, no, in general, it increases, yeah. it increases the cost of every type of housing. Yeah. If you're building a triplex on land that costs $100,000, you know, it costs this much. If you're building a triplex on land that costs twice that, it costs more. And therefore, the triplexes, you know, each unit costs more. Yeah. And rents for more. So, you know, this could be a legitimate issue. Um, there's also concerns that higher costs of living brought on by urbanized areas with UGBs are actually um, stifling diversity in cities that have them because by being minority communities cannot afford to move there. I, I see reason to believe that. I mean... It's not impossible. Well, looking at the demographics of Portland, yeah. um, <laughs> there was a study done a few years ago that maybe as many as t- of 10% of Portland's black population had left in the 2010s and 2020 mm. or 20 teens. So, you know, there are some valid concerns there. Yeah. No further comment? Okay. <laughs> I don't have any more comments unless somebody has put, like, a number on how much this increases per unit housing costs because, like, doubling land costs would significantly increase the price of, like, a duplex but have a much lower increase in the price of an apartment in a huge apartment block. But it is still an increase. It is, which is why I'm not going to make any further comments until somebody can put a number on how big that increase is Uh, for different people. Yes. See, I just appreciate that the on the left section is all hypothetical. We need to look into this more. Well, uh, there are some studies linked in the um, in the what do you call it? Sources, source notes. To well, the on the left is these. what problems will this cause for broader society, and the on the right is the I don't like it. <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah. General petulance. Yes. Yeah. Um, that is very clear, but. And then, if you don't do it right, yes, urban growth boundaries will drive suburban sprawl in places yes, that they absolutely happen. will. If you put the, if you put an urban growth boundary around like just one metro area, let's say I state, have um, you know crapping ham upon goofball or something, <laughs> and you put an urban growth boundary around the whole town. It's fifty miles. We have a fifty mile green belt around the whole town, but there's a billion jobs in crapping ham upon goofball, and <laughs> everybody needs to go to the fifty billion jobs. Well, you know, you can only build so much in Crappingham upon Goofball, so you're going to build 50 miles away, and people will just drive into the city through the green belt. Yep. Yeah. So you just need to be really strategic about it. Yes. Yeah, the urban growth boundary needs to... Ex- the policy it needs to be application regional. needs to apply, like, hundreds of miles away from where well, it's intended to control density. Maybe a hundred of miles away would do it. Yeah. Very few people are commuting, you know... From Logan to Salt Lake. Yeah, from Logan to Salt Lake. Very <laughs> few people Spanish are commuting to Salt Lake. Salt Lake. Yep. Except students. There's a lot of students commuting from Logan to Salt Man, Lake. Man, if and only there was a yeah. goddamn bus. Or a train. Uh, it yeah, would take like five train. hours. Most people would probably drive anyway from, well, on that direct one, bus? to be honest with you. Uh, state-sponsored Amtrak. <laughs> stops in Ogden. You could do a direct bus that wouldn't, with like a couple of interim stops. It wouldn't be yeah, substantially but we slower could, than we driving, and have, it would be more cost-effective. We cost couldn't effective. have an express bus, Kyle. Those are clearly outmoded, and we can only run them during peak periods, and therefore are useless in the post-pandemic oh, yeah. era. See, I'm thinking service plan, initial. Ogden to Logan, intermediate stops. Once that pr- proves to be massively popular, Logan mm. to downtown Salt Lake, to the university, maybe like a couple of interim stops. Yeah. And it runs in the new center median of the new I-15 that is bus only. I, you, no, you mean the reversible lanes. Why isn't it just bus only? During. Because we have no need for additional we don't bus have that many I-15 buses. corridor. Yeah. We have a yeah. regional yeah. rail yeah. line, yeah. yeah. So, Doto Logo. Doto Logo. Doto <laughs> Solo Say. I just say Doto Sala. Okay, that's good. <laughs> Kyle's making actionable threats against us at yeah. the moment. In Minecraft. Doto logo to Doto Sola. And, uh, and Univ D. Yes. University District. <laughs> 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 uh, 
If somebody doesn't cancel us for this, I will. He's going to cancel us for being via, good at acronyms. Via SAC, Central <laughs> City. <laughs> okay. Um, and then, yeah. So, my opinion... Yeah, that is what it says in the story. <laughs> <laughs> Conclusion. My opinion. My opinion. My opinion is that urban growth boundaries are generally a good idea, and most of the kind of affordability issues that we see with them are caused by restrictive land use planning within within the urbanized area. Because, you know, even in Portland, which is kind of a city that is well known for having hippie liberal policy. Progressive housing policy. Mm-hmm. Um, or hippie liberal policies. Yes. Uh, like in excess of 60 to 65 percent of usable housing land is zoned R1 or the Portland equivalent until very recently. So out of if if we're having and, like and, a and in and in the Portland suburbs, which are also in the urban growth boundary, you know, almost everything is still zoned like for mostly single family houses. So if we had a, a, a fight, a fist fight between R1 zoning and urban growth boundaries to see who could cause the most housing affordable ho- housing affordability issues, I think the uh, former would win. Well, I mean, if you if you stick the two together, it's a deadly combination. I'll say that. Yeah. Lexington, mm-hmm. Kentucky is not an affordable city. Both, both of these policies restrict the supply of land that you can build tall things on. And tall things I mean you can put more people in a light. Yeah. Going up is cool. And, and also based. cost effective. Very based. Red Very pilled. red pilled, yeah. yeah. Well, if you asked our professor, he would say you have to build single family. Oh good <laughs> lord. Oh. Yeah, there's clearly a revealed market preference for single family houses. By the fact that, that it's is the definitely only thing that's not allowed. anything to do with the fact that even it's in the, the largest cities it is eighty five percent of zoned housing capacity. Now, you just go switch the knob from R1 mandatory to R1 optional, and you see how fast the, those how buildings go up. How about instead we just switch it to R4 minimum, and I'll call it a day. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else have any comments on that? Your opinion of urban growth boundaries? I, I um, like the potential for preserving public land and open spaces, which would greatly improve people's quality of life. I like having farms close to cities. I think that's a very underrated aspect of the urbanist discourse is that it would be very good if we had local farms close to cities who could supply Food. fresh produce that's not shipped in from a billion miles away. Farm that's to table. Like also a very like climate resiliency thing because Pumped as up. cheap as it is, like as carbon cheap as it is to ship food around the world using container ships and such, mm-hmm. it could be cheaper if you simply have to take it into town five miles away. Via your train. It would also be... Or a truck, Kyle. (laughs) Well, until which point we have the train. For your giant indoor farmer's market, you built next to your rail terminal. Well, but... (laughs) In terms of distribution, it doesn't really make any sense to... Farm streetcar, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, the street... Yeah, our tram goes directly to farm (laughs) fields. Well, it provides passenger service out there, and then it hitches on with the automatic coupler to the the produce, and then drops it off. This would cause no problems. No. No. I want to try it. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it does seem like having farms nearby the city would be good for fresh produce, but also... Just being able to have, like, your state's thing. Like, if you were in Florida, be be like, we have our oranges. oranges and yeah. we're proud. Oregon. Oh, look, our marijuana farm. <laughs> Locally sourced <laughs> weed. Yeah. Salt Lake alfalfa farm. <laughs> yeah, locally sourced alfalfa for all of your digestion needs. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, here we're fortunate with open space, with having the valley, because you can go walk up a mountain. That that is probably one of the main reasons we have good quality of life is that you access to the mountains. Mountain. Yeah, but our if, life expectancy still sucks because everyone's breathing in, you know, four tobacco, sh- four cigarettes yeah. a day. It only sucks if you're by the highway and the airport. So you mean everyone? Yeah. Ten years. 
you gain 10 years if you're up on the bench, if you're uh-huh. uh, a rich Good. whitey. Good. So. Great. I do not live on the bench. Yeah, no. And well, and I never you, will. Then you also <laughs> have the obligation to uh, make everything worse for everyone else. We did live on the bench. Student Briefly, housing. Yeah, 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 well, that was more of an accident. Yeah. I can't afford student housing, so... No, mm-hmm. nobody, not very many people can. Yep. Um, well... Hey, in UC Berkeley, it's illegal. <laughs> it is, yeah. 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 But anyways, Thanks. yeah, I contest the idea that Utah's sprawl has been at all limited by geographical constraints. Look at Payson. Look at the areas north and to the west of Ogden. Look at the Tuolo Valley. Out of sight, out of mind. Yeah, that's the spirit. <laughs> sure. Um, I would also like to note that urban growth boundary would be very good for my hometown of Boise, Idaho, which is <coughs> rapidly <coughs> consuming farmland. Save the farmland. And is third, 20 years behind Salt Lake in terms of development? Yes, yeah. and it, it will be where the salt where Salt Lake County is today in 20 years. Yeah. So Down a light rail system. Open uh, boundary minus, yeah. now. <laughs> yeah, minus all the good minus things. Minus the light rail system. Yeah, Kylie is right about that. Yeah. <sighs> so Boise Boise could have what we want look I give me dictatorial powers over Boise Idaho for a period of 10 years and see how it turns out see I want Draper to still be a farm that's yes. that's what I wish I think we should bulldoze Draper, Draper and turn it back into a farm I'm my, dad pr- my dad would probably be, ma- be mad about that. Your dad can't fight a bulldozer. <laughs> <laughs> Watch my him. bulldozer could beat up your dad. <laughs> are, are we going to make a red line podcast kill dozer? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> For Daybreak? We just... Uh, yeah. Wait, we like Daybreak now. Oh, yeah. No, I, I meant uh, Draper. Oh, I Sorry, see. the two Ds get confused. <laughs> Actually, yeah. Draper's fine. Draper's better than other places. It has smaller roads, which I do appreciate. In the newer developments. Well, yeah. And also, like, it doesn't have as many, like, six-lane, like, massive strode arterials. Mostly just because it's on the corner of the map. Yeah. So it gets but to that feed makes, off of everybody else's That makes me like arterials. it better. Gotcha. Because uh, it can feed off of everyone else's And, hey, Daybreak's on the corner of the map, so maybe corner of the map good. Hey, the university's on the corner of the map. Depends how big your map is. Yeah. Yeah. Valley. <laughs> Meanwhile, Magna's on the other corner. Three out of four is not bad. What's wrong with Magna? A lot of things. I went to their main street. Kyle's shit. racist against Magna. I don't think I've ever been to Magna. It's I went fine. there once on my bike. Would not recommend cycling there. Absolute hell. It's West Valley. I don't know what you're expecting. Anything? Well, you've seen the place where I ran into the sign that said end bike lane in the <laughs> middle of a f- <laughs> seven lane street. Like, it was not enjoyable. Just one I more imagine. lane, bro, except it's a bike lane. <laughs> yeah. So then I had to bike on the sidewalk over a bridge to get to the Decker Lake Trail. Uh, <laughs> if only well, it's a good thing you didn't have the good thing you didn't have that yeah. in real life. You're spoiling <laughs> things. Um, you guys have to bleep that. You're spoiling Metro. Are we just going to bleep everything we don't like instead of editing around it? I mean, you can do that if that's easier for you. No. Boost engagement because oh. people... Yeah, people think people that want to know really bad. Like, yeah. They all wanted to know what I said last time, and it was really... <laughs> beep. Beep. Yeah, hey, it wasn't an actionable threat. You don't have to beep it. Uh, are we going to have to beep the beep? It wasn't an actionable threat. It is physically impossible for me to beep <laughs> the beep. <laughs> Great. Okay, so we can say horrible things as long as they don't technically qualify that as actionable threat. Yeah, like I could say something like really homophobic. <laughs> and then just say in Minecraft at the end and it's okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, um... Oh, no. <laughs> oh, I'm trying to think of something that isn't actually offensive. Oh, um, I hate Subarus in Minecraft. <laughs> That's very homophobic. Oh, because only le- lesbians drive yeah, Subaru. Subaru's a lesbian car, so. <laughs> well. In Minecraft. <laughs> oh, okay. No, no <laughs> hey, you were the one drawing beep on the game last night. So I'm maybe okay. Boise should have an urban growth boundary, um, yeah. uh, which is why I think that the greater uh, Oregon movement should succeed. And then uh, number two... Oh, so instead of Boy- Idaho doing policy, we can have Oregon do it for them? Yeah, we can have I- Oregon do policy. It would be a narrowly blue state. 
Yeah. <laughs> Narrowly, like a hundred thousand votes is pretty narrow. So. Yeah. Well, Salt Lake. It's probably late, but you could make an urban growth boundary and not touch it for the next fifty years and Basically, still be fine. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, because there's so much info like, that we I could do. I would draw it over. The damage is done to most of the stuff. Where? The valley. Salt Lake County. There's not. There's no going back Utah on that. Utah County. So, like, Davis County. Yeah. Well, I just say you like. Maybe we should just north south cap it. In addition to like capping off the stuff on the west side of Utah Lake. Or we could just draw a normal urban growth boundary. Okay, well, yeah, but as part of the, the big squiggly line would be a limit on the north and south ends. Yeah. And then we can fill, fill, complete a front runner extension to cover everything within the UGB. Yeah. yeah. And then UTA would have, like, a defined area that it knows it needs to serve this in the next... This is the UTA service area. See, we should have a Cache Valley urban growth boundary. Oh, my gosh, yeah, they could still save some stuff there if they went yeah. hard on it. Yeah. Well, because Smithsfield and Logan are no longer separate. Yeah. It's all sort of you starting to You can tell it's together. the last 10 yeah. years. Yeah. 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 It's, so. it's getting They probably botched the policy and they'd lose their cheap housing. Yeah. Well, yeah, because you can't have apartments in Logan. You can't have more than three unrelated adults. Oh, my. Ah, that is not a law in Portland. Good. Another, another common. Good. I Portland still don't. Well, they're pro I still don't get that. But. Common Portland. Oh yeah, yeah it is for. It is for brothels. It's yeah. for beeps. It, well, the brothels does not need to be beeped. With the, no, it doesn't. With the differentiation between um, three in a city containing a university and four in other cities, I think it's specifically to shaft university students and make housing people get more money. I would a hundred percent believe that. Yeah, I don't doubt that. Common Portland W. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So basically, if you're going to implement a UGB, implement it on a region wide scale, scale or even state scale, and at the same exact time, also Nation. unrestrict most of your zoning. No more single family exclusive zoning. Mm hmm. And do Just it now. Zone it residential. Everything should be zoned residential mixed use. I don't care. Yeah. Yep. Yep. You yep. you should be able to put a store in your front yard. You should be able to build a sixty story apartment tower in your front yard. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> or at the very minimum do what California is doing and don't they have like their builders remedy thing. Well where you that's have, like, very complicated stories? because every city had to submit a compliant housing element for state bill six three four or something. One one I don't know. One one three four or six three four, which was a law requiring cities to um zone up zone for an, a certain amount of housing ah. or expand their boundaries for, to accommodate for a certain amount of new housing in hopes of making California not the most expensive place to live on the planet. Um, and then a lot of cities simply refuse to do that because they don't want to build new housing. So if you don't submit a compliant housing element, then you are subjected to the builder's remedy, which is anyone can build basically anything in your city so long as it's 20% affordable. Sweet. Cool. Cool. It works for me. So do a less California housing policy means, and uh, do a less convoluted version of California. It's, it's well, California. it's perfectly like reasonable. It's just like yeah. I'll never live in California. Right. Cut to either. cut to me living in California. <laughs> I know they have nice yeah. things. You wonder why housing is so expensive. People yeah, want to live. People want to live in California because California I, is a nice place to live. I don't want to live. Concept. There, so. Me neither. But like, <laughs> you know, yeah. I want to live north of there. Mm. <laughs> You got that right. I on like the C A H on the C A H S R extension. No, I want to live on the Amtrak Cascades, and there are exactly four cities I can envision myself living on, which are on the Amtrak Cascades. Gotcha. Cool. Two of them are Vancouver. <laughs> 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 well put. Okay, outro time. Yep. Uh, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe on YouTube, and to follow and leave us a rating on iTunes and Spotify. If you like what we do here, please consider subscribing to our Patreon, where you can get access to our regular content early, as well as to Patreon exclusive episodes every Especially single month. Especially the one that we didn't even have a script for today, or whenever we were supposed to record it. We're recording it. one today. Okay, after we're done with this one? Yeah. Okay, sounds good. If that's okay. Yeah. It's going to sure. be short. We're just going to talk about my concerns of tracks ridership mostly yeah and your concerns of tracks ridership i assume um yeah so 
Uh, yeah, speaking of, our patrons are... At Double Tracked uh, Electrified Rio Grande Plan Frontrunner Tier, Zach Adams. Hi, Zach. Thanks for dinner. Uh, $25.69 a month, we have Zach Adams. And at Frontrunner Tier, $10, we have Mike Christensen, Curtis Herring, Phobos2390, and... Isn't there one more? Devin. Devin. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Then at $5, our red line tier, we have Brian Smith, Christopher Whaley, Jacob Whitecotton, and Robert P. Walsh. And at the blue line tier, which is closely approaching the size of the blue line fleet, we have (laughs) Jess Cuz, Alex Mm -hmm. Dykelski, Ben Boothseth, Bradley Bondi, DJ Will Watkins. I will. Elijah Kensler, Ethan McDonald, G4, Gonza12, Jack Dean, John Heron Gorman, Martin Hecker Martinez, Old Trolley, Patrick Sloss, Scott Harris, and Seth. You guys are a force. Yeah, rocking. Yeah. Pretty soon we're going to be able to fill up a whole tracks car. Seated capacity. Yeah. Yeah. Not theoretical capacity. Crush load is large. Well, and yeah, subscribe. We have stickers subscribe. on their way. So. Yeah. yeah. We bought stamps. Yeah, we did. Uh, we bought grape, blueberry, pear, and Tiffany stamps to My go along. My favorite with, flavors of stamps. <laughs> to, go, to go along <laughs> with the postcard coral reef stamps so we can get your orders out. Oh, cool. Yeah. So, All God bless the USPS selling one cent stamps for one cent. United States well, that's how much Postal they're worth. Service <laughs> is the greatest thing in this country.